I did it based on lack of knowledge. So making mistakes when you have no idea that you're making mistakes is very easy. But Hashem decided that, okay, it's time to wake him up. And since he's not waking up by losing money, he's not waking up by making all these mistakes in the business. I have to wake him up by giving him the biggest thing. So in November 18th of 2006, I went to have a simple surgery that was supposed to take a couple of hours and send me home. Not one of those heart surgeries that I'm supposed to be there for months or anything. Simple surgery. The same level of surgery as if, let's say, for example, you went to fix your eyes. You, know, you go if you, I, I, I had also done one I'm thinking early 2000 you go there they uh, do the laser surgery on your eyes you know it's maybe a f- few minutes and they send you home a little more than that but not quite a serious surgery so I went to have an elective surgery the doctor told me that I'll be before the surgery the doctor told me that I'll be uncomfortable for a few days but I'll be back to work on Monday I said, okay, taking off a couple of days of work is not I went to the surgery, and I woke up out of the surgery screaming my lungs out because something went wrong with the surgery. They cut something, they did something, they f- did something that cut some type of nerve, and they had no clue that they did it. Nerves can't be fixed. So my screaming couldn't be fixed. They gave me enough drugs to kill a person, which eventually calmed me down after a couple of hours. And I foolishly thought that it's over. So, as I was supposed to, I went home. I went home, not thinking anything of it. I had a sandwich of shawarma. And I told everybody good night. I woke up 45 minutes later, screaming even worse than what I did at the hospital. Only this time I didn't have all the drugs they have in the hospital. And I didn't stop screaming for 62 days. For 62 days, the most amount of consecutive sleep that I was able to get was 15 minutes. Now when you can't sleep, your body starts failing. Your body stops functioning. So you start dying. So I'd start bleeding from my eyes and ears. What did you get surgery for? Something that's completely unrelated to anything that I'm going to tell you after. It was an elective surgery. It was a hemorrhoid surgery. Hemorrhoid surgery is something that 66% of the population have. So how did they mess up on your surgery? Hashem, Hashem made it happen. I just thought they did. Hashem had to wake me up, is the point of the story. What nerve did they hit? No one knows to this day. Since I had a lot of money, over the next seven years, I spent everything that I could going to over 50 doctors, trying to diagnose what happened. Because the problem was no longer what I had before the surgery, the hemorrhoids. The hemorrhoids was not, not a problem at all. The problem was that the rest of my body stopped functioning. Where from... The neck, all the way to the bottom of my feet, would hurt 24 hours a day. Things that are completely not related to the surgery. So one day I wake up and my legs have doubled in size. And I can't walk. Another day, my legs start hurting to the point where I can't function. Next day, my arms. Next day, my chest. And eventually just gets to the point where it's 24 hours a day, full body pain, well, the only way that I could function, operate, or even have a conversation is if I have enough painkillers to kill people in my body. And that's what I did. And that's what I continued trying to survive for the next seven years. So when people ask you, does Judaism talk about Gan Eden and Gehenom? The answer is yes. But there's two types of Gehenom. Gan Eden, we don't really have that much details about it because we can't fathom what good really is. We don't really know what good is because everything we think is good is what the Yetzirah told us is good and in reality it's bad. We think women 
And a new girlfriend every day is good. That's bad. We think money is good. As I told you, money leads most of the time to bad. It's necessary, but it leads more to bad than good. We think that cars cars are great. In reality, a Toyota Prius and a Ferrari will still get you from one point to the the next point. Only that the Ferrari will get you there with a bunch of sins because of all the gava you're going to have on the way. What's gava? Ego. 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 Most of the things we think are good are actually bad. So Gan Eden, we don't really have a concept of what it is. And the Torah doesn't talk that much about it. Gehenom it does. Why? Because we do have a concept of what bad is. We know what suffering is, not like what Gehenom really is, but we have a concept of suffering. People have lost people that they love. People have had broken hearts. People have had all types of difficulties, pain. People know, even even uh, you know, a kid your age knows what suffering is. Even when you were 10 years old, you know what suffering is to some extent. Obviously, as you grow up, you really realize more and more. So we have a concept of what suffering is. But there's two types of Gehenom. The one I saw and the one I learned about. The one I learned about in the Gemara and in a few other places, we're not going to talk about today. The one that I lived is point of the whole story. The one I lived, as bad as it was, living in 24 hours a day in pain, and then having all of the money that I made, millions and millions of dollars, disappear into thin air, either through bad investments, or people stealing from me, or friends taking it, everything that could go wrong, going wrong. Everything. Everything going wrong, spending every moment that I can trying to figure out why should I even live for tomorrow and being in depression and just dealing with these problems. All of that bad was my version of Ganom in this world. Because when you have pain, people don't know it unless they look at you, because you can't see pain. It's not, you know, pain is not necessarily indicated by blood. Sometimes you have pain, there's no blood. So people would look at me, and I look like a young kid, not that much older than most of you guys, and I look perfectly, perfectly normal. Only difference is that to go from here until, let's say, the corner of this room, which to a normal person will take, I don't know, maybe six or seven seconds, for me, it would take somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 minutes. And the whole way I'm screaming. Just to move. Do you lose your voice? Did I lose my voice? Yeah, like you're screaming like you said for like six minutes. Eventually you learn how to scream, you know, internally, because you don't want everybody to run away from you. But you're in pain a lot of the time, and it sucks. So living in pain 24 hours a day is not fun. And you start you get to the point where you don't want to live anymore. And then you lose the one thing that you thought you had, which was money. And you start losing that too. And then you lose the business. And then the guys you thought you were friends, they turn into enemies. Because people are vultures. In the real world, people are not really your friends. Because I could have told you, when you put money in front of someone, that's, they, they mutate in, into the golem that they really are. And all of a sudden they see that you're weak, you were this Mr. Wall Street strong, and now you're weak and they can just take advantage of it. They're vultures. So they start taking advantage of it. And it continues escalating like a snowball effect, just a really bad one. And all of that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Now you're asking yourself, how is that possible? This sounds like a nightmare. Even a nightmare sounds better than this. Because the only way that I would ever look up is if all this happened. The only way I would ask how, why, when, who, anything was if all this happened. If the rocks were thrown at me. If the rocks were thrown at me. So then, as this stuff was happening, I started learning where, is all, where are all these rocks coming from? started going to Shuret Torah, trying to see, maybe get some interest. 
my uh, life was getting more and more difficult, but I tried sticking around. And the only reason why was because I felt bad for the people that loved me, like my mom and my wife. And I knew that if I, you know, if I give up, maybe I go to some place else, but they're going to continue suffering. It's not fair. So I continued going, continued trying. And along the way, as you try, Hashem has mercy on you. He gives you little bonuses here and there. And one day, at a point that I got really, really low, at a point that I got very, very depressed, my mom, during that same time, she uh, makes calls to all these different rabbis to look for a blessing. I'll get somebody to bless me, my son is suffering and so on, but during that, this day, no one's answering the phone. Until, after about an hour and a half of dialing, she reaches a place in Israel, some number in Israel, and a woman answers, and she asks for a certain rabbi, and the woman says, I'm sorry, you dialed the wrong phone number, in Hebrew. And my mom uh, just breaks down, just starts crying to this stranger on the phone, because she's been dialing for an hour and a half, you know, helplessly, just trying to get some help, trying to get some prayers, trying to get anything. And as she cries, the woman all of a sudden says, Dolis, which is my mother's name. My mom obviously goes into shock and says, how do you know my name? And he goes, I know your name because you're my aunt, but I have no idea how you got to me because we've never spoken on the phone before and I don't have your phone number. She goes, how did I get to you? She goes, I don't know how you got to me. You dialed the wrong phone number in the wrong country, but you got not only to somebody that you know, but somebody that can recognize your voice. And someone that can actually help. So if you reach me, it has to be a reason. What's wrong? Why are you crying? So she tells her my story. I'm sick. I'm this. And my son is dying. Which, by the way, was one of the things that they were saying was happening to me. Just in a very torturous way. And uh, she says, well, if you're looking for a blessing, why don't you call my brother? He's a big Talmud Chacham in Yerushalayim. And he also lives a building away from Rabbi Vadi Yosef. He's one of his students. He talked to me? Yeah, of course. You're the aunt from America. Everybody loves you. So she calls her fine, Rabbi Ephraim Kahlon. And uh, he's in Kolel and eventually he calls her back. And she starts telling him. And now when I, when I left, when I left uh, Israel, <laughs> Ephraim is younger than I am so he was still a baby so I didn't even know he existed and so she calls him and uh, he, you know, she tells him the story and the first thing he asks is does he speak Hebrew and she says yes I right, said so can I call him and he says you can call but he's probably not going to talk to you he doesn't talk to anybody and at that very moment was the first time I called my mother in a few months as she's on the phone with him. And my mom is obviously already in the middle of the story, and I'm just getting entering the story. And she's hysterical, crying, saying, Talk to him, talk to him. And I'm like, Who? Talk to Ephraim. I'm like, Who's Ephraim, Bechlal? Who's Ephraim? Talk to him, please. He can help you. Who? Who can help me? What do you want? Why are you crying? Talk to Ephraim. I said, Okay, just, I don't know what you're saying, but whoever you want me to talk to, just tell him to call me. I'll answer the phone. Fine. And Ephraim calls me, and uh, he tells me, uh, I tell him one of my issues, I tell him about the pain, and he shows me a source for a question in the Torah. I ask him a question, he not only gives me an answer on the spot, but he gives me the exact verse in the Torah, Gemara, or anywhere else. He tells me a story of Judah and Tamar, which until this day is one of my favorite stories. And I ask him questions, and he not only gives me answers, but he gives me answers like a computer on the spot, and he gives me verses from multiple sources, and it's something that I've never seen before. In the business world, some people called me smart, but he was on a different level. He was in a different world. Never seen anything like it. We talked for an hour and 40 minutes, and all of a sudden the pain didn't hurt as much. I didn't really care that much about the pain. I was so fascinated by this smart guy I met in Jerusalem that happens to be my cousin. So the next week he called me at the same time. 
four o'clock on a Thursday. And this time we talk for three hours. Three hours worth of Torah. Three hours worth of stories, three hours worth of questions. The next week we talk for five hours. The next week we talk for seven hours. And every single Thursday, ever since, years now, we would talk for an average of anywhere between five to seven hours. And I'd ask every single question that you could ever come up with. With dinosaurs, stars, science information, Torah proofs, emunah issues, everything and anything. Business, everything. And obviously he has, he's not only a big Talmud Chacham, but I also learned later on he had a lot of Siat and Ishmael, Where he had a lot of help from Hashem. He told me that the first nine months of our conversations... He would pray, a special prayer, before our conversation, to know the answers to my questions. And I said, why? Why would you pray to you? You study this stuff. He goes, no. The questions you asked, I never even knew they existed. I never knew the questions to even know the answers. And this is one of the things that we see about Torah. Torah is not like math, science, or algebra, or, you know, algebra, or any other topic out there that you can study. If you study 10 hours of science, you get 10 hours worth of knowledge. You study 10 hours of math, you get 10 hours worth of knowledge. You study 10 hours of psychology, you get 10 hours of knowledge. 